Folks, I'm excited to get right into our message for today as we begin this new series called Ignite. Would you pray with me as we go into this time of God's Word together? Lord, I just thank you so much uh, for this day, for the privilege of being here in this place right now. Thank you for the privilege of baptism today, the privilege of getting into your word, just the different parts of worship that help us focus and center our lives on you once again. It's, it's so easy to think that this world is all about us and begin to revolve around us as we go through our weeks, but that's what worship's all about. We appreciate this time to put you back on the throne And so we pray that we're doing that today. I pray your blessings on this time in your word, though, Lord God, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive all that you have for us today. Stories, Lord God, are so important. You use stories to reach people. You use stories to touch people's hearts. And I believe that each and every one of our stories are important too. Lead us to that. Lead us to that, to know more about that today. And thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, we're starting the new worship series, of course. Jason got us started earlier and let us know that this series is called Ignite, One Life Can Change the World. And I believe that life is yours. Your life can change the world. My life can change the world. All of our lives, if they're, if they're uh, depending on Christ, can change the world. I'm convinced of it, absolutely convinced of it. Um, in looking to the future, as we began last week, we uh, uh, shared this scripture from Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. You guys should have this memorized by now. I've used it so much, but this just brings me such joy. And it's such a scripture of hope from the prophet Jeremiah. When God says through Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Do you remember that scripture? You should remember that by now. But our lives can mean something, and not just for this life, but absolutely for eternity. I want to begin with a story today. Um, as we begin talking about what telling our story can do in our lives and the lives of others. And the story is my own. Um, Folks, I grew up in a, and you've probably heard parts of this, I'm going to share a little bit more with you today, but I grew up in a pastor's home. My dad was a southern preacher. He was from North Carolina, from the Greensboro area. My mom was from that area as well. And I will say, when I say my dad's a southern preacher, I will also say my, my mom was a southern lady. And that doesn't mean the same thing up here as it does down south sometimes, but that's a real compliment down south. I just want you to know that. And so my mom, uh, that's who she was, was a southern lady. But they came north uh, working for the Wesleyan Church. They were with that denomination at the time, and they came north to plant churches. Uh, When my older brother Byron was, what, six weeks old or something, they came over the mountains. That's another whole story in itself and how God helped them get here and the car to keep running and all that. But... uh, Uh, But they came north to plant churches. Now, they planted their first church um, not too far uh, from here, a little northwest of here. And it's a small town, Wisconsin town, that has a wonderful fishing lake. And uh, your former pastor, who was here just before me, is now there. It's a little place called Partyville. Anybody ever heard of Partyville? It's near Portage or whatever. And as Pastor Kerry has reminded me, about every other month since I moved here and he moved there, uh, there's that church down the block, that Wesleyan Bible church that's still going strong and, uh, and doing well. And he keeps, I think they're competition, I think that's the deal. But anyway, but he keeps reminding me of that. That's the church that my dad planted when he first came um, to Wisconsin, the frontiers of Wisconsin in, in the late 50s. And um, so I, I grew up in this kind of home with a pastor as a dad, uh, you know, a pastor's family, a, a church planter, and so forth. And uh, this was the life uh, that he led. And so I grew up as a PK. Everybody know what a PK is? Anybody know what a PK is? Some of you do. When I went to college, I went to a Bible college down in Kentucky, and there was PKs there, and there was MKs there, missionary kids or preacher's kids, you know. And so I've been a PK all my life, and then my kids were PKs also, Uh, But this was the atmosphere um, that I was uh, raised in. You know, like a lot of PKs, too, I had something in common with other PKs, you know, other colleagues, so forth, you know, in the PK business. And that was this. I had a rebellious nature. Growing up, I was a rebel. And if you know anything about preacher's kids, a lot of them do. I don't know what their deal was, but I'll tell you what my deal was. My deal was this. I had something to prove as a preacher's kid. And what I had to prove was this, 
I'm just as normal as every other kid out there. Don't tell me I'm something different because I'm a PK. And I set about to prove that, just how normal I was, much to my parents' chagrin. But, uh, but anyway, uh, this was the home that I grew up in. This was the life that I grew up in. I, I didn't realize it at the time. I really didn't realize it. Uh, but my upbringing, especially regarding my faith, was very much a privileged existence. When it came to learning about the faith, learning about the Christian faith and so forth, I grew up going to church, learning the stories of the Bible in Sunday school, and God bless every Sunday school teacher we have in this place because you are making a difference in the lives of kids. So many Sunday school teachers have made a difference in my life growing up. But I learned the songs of the faith also, Priscilla, both Sunday school and in church. You know, I love the songs, and, and I have to tell you, all three of the songs we're singing, or two of the songs we're singing today, all the songs we're singing today, they're like all my favorites. They're ones I learned as a kid. Um, but I'll tell you, living with two Christian parents, both of them committed to Christ and his church, was not the norm. And so in a sense, spiritually, it was a very privileged existence, but I didn't always see that, it that way because I had something to prove, you know, as a kid. It was probably when I was in seventh grade that God began to get a hold of me. Oh, I'm sorry, you, you know those uh, directory pictures that never go away? Yeah, the church directory? Yeah, this is one of them, so make sure you sign up, okay? All right, anyway. Um, and, and click it one more time, Sue, if you would. And yeah, one more time. I'm waiting for something. There it is. Yep, that's me, the chubby kid in the middle, okay? With the cool glasses that had footballs on them. I don't know why I thought those were cool, but they were cool at the time. Anyway, uh, but that's me. So this is the family uh, that I grew up in in a very privileged time also. But God began to work on me when I was, and this is sixth or seventh grade, this particular picture up here. But God began to work on me, and one of the reasons was this. My dad began to have health issues serious health issues. Matter of fact, when I was in seventh grade, he had his first heart attack. And this was something new to us then, totally new to our family. It's like, man, my dad was my hero. My dad was a giant. He was like a superhero or whatever, you know? Didn't have the cape, but he had everything else, you know? And he was one of my superheroes, and now he's had a heart attack. I will never forget the day I was in shop class at Lafarge Middle School or High School, you know? in Lafarge, and the superintendent of schools, who happened to be a friend of my dad's too, came into the class and talked to the shop teacher and then pulled me aside and said, your dad's just had a heart attack. He was taken to the hospital in La Crosse, I think it's Gunderson or whatever now, and we don't know if he's going to make it. And that was the news I got. Well, what I didn't know at that time is he'd just come from another class telling my older brother Byron, who lives in Fond du Lac, the same news. And as Byron and I were talking about this, my brother Byron, we, we, we talked about that this was like a cloud that hung over our heads from that point forward through school, you know, through junior high and high school, that there's a possibility that dad's not going to be with us, that he could have another heart attack, he could be taken like that. They weren't real knife happy in those days, so they didn't do the surgery quite so fast. They kind of watched you to see if you'd have another heart attack or something, I guess. I don't know. But that's kind of how it seemed to us. And so because of this, folks, I began to ask questions. As a young person in middle school, I began to ask questions, and the questions were these. If dad dies, what's going to happen? Are we going to have to learn to live? Because he was the only one employed, and we all knew that. My mom was home with five kids. And it was that, time, it was that day, too, where that's just how it worked. But how in the world are we going to get through this without a dad? And if dad dies... Here's another thing that hit me. Where's he going to go? Where's he going to go? And then I took it one step further, which I'm pretty impressed with as a seventh grader, but, you know, these things come to your mind. And, and, and I began to ask myself, you know, if I died, where would I go? Where would I end up? If death is a reality, I mean, it's right here at my back door. It's now in our family, the possibility. What in the world is going to happen? Well, I, I began to remember things that my dad had taught me and they really kind of backed me up here. And so I knew about heaven. I knew about faith in Christ and all this. I also knew at the time that I hadn't made that decision yet. I hadn't decided to be a follower of Christ yet in middle school. But I had a good youth worker. Her name's Barbara Miller. She's a retired United Methodist clergy now from this conference. She wasn't a met pastor at that time. She was my youth worker at the home church there in Lafarge. And she also 
came to see us kids. And she backed us up on what we knew, that dad was going to be okay, and if he went, he was going to be okay there too, because of heaven, because of our faith, and so forth. But folks, this was challenging to a young person. It was challenging to me in middle school. It wasn't too long after that. It was the summer of 72, and that's about as close as I can get to telling you when this was. But our wonderful youth worker took us to a youth night at a uh, kind of a rally that was going on at an area high school. And uh, when you lived in Lafarge, Viroqua was like the big town you went to. If anybody's been to Viroqua, it's not a big town. But anyway, but it was to us. And so at the high school there, there was this family that was going to be there for a whole week. And Wednesday night was the youth night. And it was Lowell Lundstrom. Lowell Lundstrom and the Lundstrom family. Here they are, Larry and Gloria and Connie and, yeah, Connie and Lowell. Lowell's on the right. So Lowell was the one who was kind of heading things up and And we went to this youth night, uh, our youth worker. Anybody here ever have a big station wagon growing up, like a full-size one? Anybody remember those days, you know, the full-size station wagon? So she goes around to the houses, and she picks us up in this big old family truckster, you know. And uh, no seatbelts, folks, I'm just telling you. They didn't exist in those days, you know. But she piled the kids in, and we all went over to Viroqua. We got there late, so we sat in the back of the auditorium, the back of the gymnasium, what they had set up as an auditorium. And Lowell played music. And if you know me, you know I'm into music, and the music got to me. And and he was the one that said during this time, he says, you know, at 100 yards, I look like Elvis. And I sound a little like him, too. And actually, his singing, I'm not talking about Elvis Costello. For those of you who are younger, I'm talking about the original. But anyway, he did sound a bit like him. Their music was absolutely fantastic. Priscilla used to follow that family, so talk to her about how good they were. But they were really, really good. And then he began to preach. So he had your attention with the music, and he began to preach. And as he preached, it seemed like everybody around me, sitting around me, some who were very, very close to me in life, began to make fun of everything he was saying and he was talking about. But I was listening. As a seventh grader, eighth eighth grader at this time, almost in eighth grade, I was listening. I was listening. And at the end of his talk his little message, he asked, he said, if there's anybody here who has not made a decision for Christ and you feel like you need to, because he kept preaching about, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And you know what the truth is today, folks? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't. With my dad going through what he had done, man, I was right there with him. I knew what he meant. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He said, so if you want to make a decision, he goes, I'm going to give you a time at the end here. There's people up here who will pray with you, but make a public confession. He says, come forward. So here I am in eighth grade. I will tell you this. I got up from the crowd in the back of that gymnasium. I left my girlfriend who was sitting right beside me making fun of everything he said. And some other folks, too, who were very close to me, and I didn't care. And I walked forward that night, and I publicly made a profession that I was going to be a follower of Christ. And they prayed with me, and then they took me in a side room. I remember it just like it was yesterday. And there wasn't any hocus-pocus going on in the side room. By the way, they just handed you materials. So they handed you a little Bible. They handed you some things that you needed to read. Now you need to read this if you've made this decision. So here's what's going to get you down the road. But, folks, that day was the day that my life began to change. That day was the day... And here's what the big difference is. The big difference was before this, I had many fears. I feared so much. I feared the end of my life. I feared the end of other people's lives. I would fear this and fear that. After that day, because I had an encounter with Jesus, the fear was gone. That's the difference of knowing Jesus and getting through this life. The fear was absolutely gone. But that, folks, was the beginning of a brand new life. Has it been perfect? No. As a friend of mine said, because we're human beings, even our walk with Christ is sometimes two steps forward, one step back, you know, and back and forth it goes. That's the reality of it. But the decision was made. No more living life totally on my own, not without God's help. I used to worry about death. Now I knew that God knew me. God knew me personally, and eternity was mine. I had that assurance. Pam, I hear you've been studying that word in your Tuesday night study lately. That's a theological term, but assurance. You know, a story is a powerful thing. This is a, you know, any story is a powerful thing. My story, your story. And if you learn to tell your story, God can use your story in amazing ways beyond your imagination. 
And folks, this series, Ignite, is all about how one life can change the world. And here's where we're going to begin today about how to tell your story. This is one way we can begin to change the world around us. One life can do it, is telling your story. Bottom line is this. This series is for you to grow deeper in your faith by learning how to ignite the faith of others around you. And this, this is the part that's the grow part. You see these banners on the side wall up here? Some of you will have to turn around. You know they're back there. But love, grow, and serve. This is our vision statement. This is how we as Trinity make disciples for Jesus Christ. So this is the grow part. We're going to be doing some growing. But I want to begin today with another story. This is an incredible story. This man was a nobody. I mean, really a nobody before. But after he had an encounter with Jesus, everybody knew him. And for good reason. So let me turn to our scripture for today. This is from John chapter 9. And this is the story of a gentleman who was born blind. Can you imagine being the parents of a man who was born blind and he'd been blind all his life? And he ended up there in Jerusalem being a beggar. He used to beg down by the pool of Siloam. That was the lower part of the city, down the hill in other words. The lower part of the city, that was the water source down there. Then there was another water source up here. But he would beg down by the pool of Siloam. But the day he met Jesus, his entire life changed. Listen to this. Follow along with me. John 9, beginning with verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? You see, this is where their theology went in those days. They, they believed there was a cause. It was a, the cause of sin was why he was blind. But here's how Jesus responds a little bit differently. He says it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Could God have been planning this very day since the day this man was born? It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. We must quickly, Jesus says, carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But where, while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he does something that, I don't know, as far as I can tell, this is not very medical. Okay? This is not very medical. What does he do? Then he spit on the ground, he made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. And he told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came back, how? Seeing, didn't he? He was obedient to what Jesus asked him to do, and look how it turned out. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, nah, he just looks like him. Wouldn't that be frustrating if you were that man? But the beggar kept saying, yes, I'm the same one. And they asked, who healed you? What happened? And he told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed. Now I can see. Okay, and then we enter into, in the middle of the story, I'm not going to read it all to you, but this is what I call a Pharisaic inquisition. The Pharisees get a hold of this guy. They call him in. They rake him over the coals. They want to know what's going on. And so they argue with him. Then they called his parents in, and they try to bring his parents into it. And his parents say, look, he's of age He's an adult, you know, don't bring us into it and so forth. But the Pharisees keep raking him over the coals, and then they called him in a second time. And that's where I'm going to pick up verse 24. So for the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God, should we get, God should get the glory for this. Boy, they will try any angle, won't they, these Pharisees? God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Do you guys realize how wrong they were? Do you realize how wrong they were? If they would have just listened to the language that this man was using telling his story, they would have known that that was prophecy being fulfilled and that this was the Messiah. But they didn't. How does he respond? This simple man who'd been a beggar all his life, blind. He says, I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. And this is the prophetic words right here that comes from our prophets. I was blind, and now I can see. He goes back at him again, I, I, you know, back with him again. And, and the Pharisees just keep pounding him and keep pounding him, and so on and so forth, <clears throat> telling the guy he's a sinner, putting him down, all this kind of stuff. Jesus picks up on it, and he goes and finds the man. So we pick up in verse 35. When Jesus heard what had happened, 
he found a man and he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? That's what Jesus called himself. And the man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. I can see Jesus with a grin on his face, just saying, well, you've seen him. You've seen him. And he is speaking to you right now. And because it was him, the one who had healed this man, he said, yes, Lord, I believe, the man said. And he worshiped Jesus. Folks, what a day this man had. He goes from being born blind to being able to see. He goes from not having uh, that assurance of his salvation that he knows to an encounter with Jesus and a connection to eternity that I'm sure even he had trouble believing. But he believed in Jesus and he worshiped Jesus after that. What an incredible story. But folks, because he'd met Jesus, had an encounter with him, he now had a story to tell. So guess what that means? Any of us who accept Christ into our lives, who have an encounter with Christ, we now have a story to tell too. And it's not our story, it's God's story. I'll get back to that in a little bit. But we have a story to tell too. So in the meantime here, you know, Jesus goes into town. Everybody's talking about him. He makes the front page of the newspaper, you know, whatever it is. And then the Pharisees try to trap him, of course, and catch him doing something wrong. But the blind man keeps going with his story. He's just a simple man. Doesn't have all the theological terms that the Pharisees do. He doesn't have that kind of education, that kind of background. Guess what? It doesn't matter. He just kept repeating over and over again what he knew to be true. Others kept asking him about what happened. His response was always the same. I don't know why Jesus did what he did. I can see him getting frustrated after a while, you know? I don't know why Jesus did what he did. The mud in the eyes and all that stuff. I don't know what he did. But all I know is this. I just know I was blind. And now I see. That's it. That's my story. Pharisees even threatened to have the man expelled from the city. But he simply looked at him and said, you know what? These are the facts. Here's the facts. How can you argue with that? How can you dispute the facts? The difference, folks, was Jesus. That was what made the difference in this man's life. He changed his life. You see, you don't have to know special words to share your story. If you've had an encounter with God, God will give you words. All you have to do is explain what's happened. How are you different today than you were yesterday? Did there used to be fear and now there's not so much fear or no fear? You know, what has changed in your life? That's all we need to do. You just have to tell them how your life has changed. This is how I was, and now this is how I am. That, folks, is your story. And God can use your story to make a difference in the lives of others. Let me give you a quick principle here. This is a principle that uh, is an Ignite principle, okay? And I'm going to give you a few Ignite principles as we go through these weeks. But here's the first one that we're going to look at in this series. My testimony, by the way, if you're not familiar with the word testimony, it's a faith story. It's the story of your faith and what's happened between you and God. So my testimony is a powerful tool that God will use to lead others to faith in him. And this process is biblical, and I'm going to show you that through some other scriptures. But you see, your story of faith, your testimony of how you came to know Jesus and what difference he has made in your life is a powerful tool that God will use to lead others to faith in him. And when you share your story, your story, God's going to use it. It is powerful, powerful, powerful. And it'll ignite the faith of others as you do. Yeah, there's going to be some that have questions when we tell our story. There's going to be some that are just astonished. I know some of your stories. They would be astonished. Um, And there's others who are going to question and give you a hard time, just like those Pharisees. But you know what? It's your story. It's your story. Nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can change it. It's your story. It's your story. It's personal. It's factual. It's true. And nobody can dispute that. So with that in mind, here's my question for you. Are you prepared? Are you prepared today? Are you ready to share your story with others? I ask most people that and they say no, and that's what I expect because we're not taught to. But this is a part of our discipleship. This is a part of being a part of God's church and God's kingdom is sharing our story. So if you're not prepared, I want to show you today how your story can change the world. And here are the steps that we need to go through. You guys have got a little outline there in your bulletin so you can see where I'm at. The last part of this I'm going to go through rapidly. But the first thing is this, confirm my story. 
confirm my story. I know that I am following Jesus. A few simple steps, folks, today uh, to be able to share our story and make a difference in the lives of others, to ignite their faith. But the first thing is confirm. Here is where, where you make sure you have a testimony to share. You make sure you have a faith story to share. The reason some people don't share their faith story, I believe, is because they lack this thing called assurance. They lack the assurance to know that they are saved, that they have experienced salvation. And maybe that's you today, but you're in good company because that was John Wesley's story too. The, the author and, and the, the creator of, of Methodism, you know. John Wesley was there. He'd been a priest for years and he still didn't have this assurance. I'll get back to that in a little bit. But do I really know Jesus? Am I going to heaven? Those, those questions that I began to ask in, in middle school or junior high, these are questions we need to ask. If you made a decision to follow Jesus already, you can rest assured that you're going to heaven and that you've been forgiven and that you have a purpose for living. God doesn't want us in the dark on those things or to wonder about that. God wants us to know, and that's called assurance. In 1 John, Pam, I don't know why I keep going back to 1 John because that's what you guys are studying too. But 1 John 5.13, John says this. He says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. I have written to this who you, to you who what? Believe. You who are believers. So he's talking to believers. So that what? So that you can know. Know what? So that you can know eternal life and know that you have it. Study the story of John Wesley. He'd been an Anglican priest for years, but still lacked that assurance of his salvation that he saw in a group of German Christians called Moravians. And he sailed over on the boat to America to do some mission work and sailed back with him. And all he knew was during the storms, he experienced great fear on the open sea. These Moravians, they were singing songs. They were having a good time. They weren't afraid at all. And he's like, what have they got that I don't have? And by the way, those Moravians, for those of you who've been a part of this church for a long time, they're the ones that developed into the Brethren. Evangelical United Brethren, EUB, Moravians were the start of that. So that's kind of where that history comes in. But John was afraid. He had this fear about him. He couldn't shake. He couldn't get over. And so suddenly he goes to a Bible study on Aldersgate Street there in in London, and he heard the preface of Luther, Martin Luther's commentary to the Romans being read out loud. And God touched his heart. And it was that night that he finally had the assurance of his own salvation and that God knew who he was, and that he was going to be okay. So folks, do you know when that decision was that you made in life? When was the decision made to give your life to Jesus? Now, I'm not into spiritual birthdays. Some people are. you got to know the exact date and exact time. I'm not there, okay? I can tell you it was the summer of 72. That's all I can tell you. I'm not sure beyond that, and and that's okay. I think the most important thing, I'm kind of with Paul on this one, where the Apostle Paul says, I died daily to myself. In other words, I commit to Christ every day. So I'm telling you today, if you can't think of when this happened to you, today's a good day. Today's a good day. The most important thing today is that uh, we give our life to Christ today so that we can have that assurance of our salvation to spending eternity with God. This is where it all begins. What's the second thing? So we, we confirm our story, knowing that we're a follower of Christ. Here's the second thing that has to happen. We need to complete our story. You can't tell a story that you haven't completed. And I'm a firm believer that if you write things down, you're going to know how to, you know, how, how am I able to stand here and deliver a message? Because I wrote it down first. I wrote it down, and then I studied it and studied it and studied it. If we do the same thing with our story, we're going to be able to share that with other people. You don't have to be a fiction writer. You don't have to make anything up. You know why? Because it's your story. Randy, I'm picking on you. You're right there. But your story is your story, Randy. Nobody can add to it or take away from it. It's your story of your encounter with God. And working in this area of discipleship, I've discovered that people have a variety of experiences when they come to Christ. And I know some experience a very emotional experience, uh, you know, with tears and so forth. But then for others, it's the exact opposite. Everybody doesn't experience God in the same way. For some, it's the exact opposite. For some, it's more of an intellectual decision. And it was for a gentleman by the name of C.S. Lewis. Ever heard that name before? C.S. Lewis, prolific author and and theologian and so forth. And I just just love C.S. Lewis. But the way he tells his story, 
he, he went out for a walk in the woods one day. And he walked through the woods, and he's a philosopher, of course, too, and so he's asking himself questions. Should I become a believer of Christ or not? That was the big question for the day. And he took a walk, and he thought, thought about it. Well, long story short, at the end of the walk, he decided, I should become a believer. There's enough evidence. I should become a believer. And he became a believer, but it was more of an intellectual decision for him. There's a gentleman by the name of Lee Strobel, maybe that name, uh, Case for Christ. There's other, other uh, books, too, that he's written now. But he was a legal editor for the Chicago Sun-Times. And he came home one day, and his wife had been to a Bible study, and he found out she'd become a Christian that day. What's this all about? I mean, he's thinking this to himself. He didn't tell her this, but he's thinking to himself, well, what's this all about? What's she got herself in the middle of now? What kind of cult is this or whatever? You know, and it, it was just a you know, Bible study. It was a Christian church. And he set off to disprove Christianity. He thought, you know, with my legal background, with my investigative journalism background, I can, I can disprove Christianity. And so he set out to do that. Guess what happened? He became a Christian. That's what happened. He became a Christian. That's his story. For some of you, it may be more of a spiritual story. Something happened in your heart or in your soul, and you really don't know how to describe it, but it happened. And that's kind of Wesley on Aldersgate Street, too. That was pretty much his story. But first, we've got to write it out, folks. Then we've got to practice it. In your bulletin today is an extra insert. I don't know if you saw that or not, but there's an extra insert in there, and there's six questions in there. And those six questions, I don't have time to go over it right now. Those six questions are for you to take home to begin to work on your story. I'll come back to those in the weeks ahead. But take this home, tuck it in your Bible or whatever, but especially look at the section that talks about why write out our story. And I'm going to give you the answers because your friends are interested. You don't think your friends are interested in your spiritual life? If they're really your friends, they're going to be. You're also, your friends can relate to it. Many of them will relate to your story. It's hard to argue with because it's your story and God's going to use it. Those are all good reasons to begin to write out your story. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3.15 says this, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, and if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. What's Peter talking about? Have your story ready. All right, let's just continue anyway. Well, trust me, it was a young lady who, uh, um, and I've never heard of this before, but a part of her story is um, she actually was in prayer one day for a young man who she'd got to know who was in the Marines. He was deployed overseas and uh, so forth. Anyway, in the midst of all this, um, God told her to give him his, her number. I've just never heard that before. Give him your number. And so anyway, he called her and so forth, and they talked. And this deployment overseas was, uh, was uh, just way too long. She thought she could handle it. She was an independent person, you know, but she couldn't. She'd talk to him for just a few minutes at a time. If you've ever had somebody overseas that's deployed, it's kind of how it happens, and they get cut off. But folks, she got down on her knees, and she was just afraid for this guy every day and so forth. And the one thing that happened to her when she really came to know Christ and gave her life to Christ during the midst of this was she knew no fear. The fear was gone. People would ask her, aren't you worried about him? No, he's in God's hands. Totally transformed, totally changed. And so that was her story too. But the important thing is we have to complete our story. We have to get it to a point where we can share it with others. And, and her church actually helped her produce a video. And so it was just a wonderful, wonderful. I'll see if I can put it up on the website for you. And the final thing is this. How else do we uh, affect others' lives with our story? We commit our story. Commit my story is the last thing I want to talk about. Ask God to use my story. And actually, it's not really our story anyway, is it? If we've given our lives to Christ, it's his story. It's his story. And so ask God to use your story. Um, I want to look at one more scripture and then I'm going to close. But folks, whenever you commit your story to God, God will use it in powerful ways. And so, Sue, I'm skipping a couple here uh, down to the uh, 1 Timothy 1. The 1 Timothy 1 verse, it's on the back of your connection card as well. And this is going to be kind of our verse for this entire series. But, but read this with me, would you? But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. That's Paul's story. You know what? That's also my story. 
I feel that way about me. That's my story, and maybe that's your story too. But here's the question for you as we leave this place and go into our work week. Who could you share your story with this week that would encourage them, that it would encourage them and help them to walk closer to God? Folks, I know some of your stories. I've been here a little over four years, and I know many of your stories are too good to keep to yourself. That's what I know. They're not my story to tell. You need to tell them, but they're too good to keep to yourself. Remember, they're not your stories. They're God's stories. If you've given your life to Christ, they're God's stories. So share them. Please share them all to the glory of God and his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I just thank you so much uh, for this day, and I thank you uh, for this time of worship that we've had together and for your word to us today. Um, I pray that you would help us to remember all that we've seen and heard and experienced in this place and just be able to take it with us into the work week. And as you open up opportunities, Lord God, for us to share our faith, help us to have something in in mind. Help us to have in mind kind of what our story is and, and just the story of how we've interacted with God in our lives and what a difference it's made in our lives. Help us to be able to share that with others. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.